I felt ashamed for crying in basic training, but it was Christmas Day. And when I looked around, the, choir, the criers were the majority. Grown men longing to be with their families and significant others, but instead stuck in basic training on Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. There were far worse places we could be, and some of us were likely to see those places with a career in the military. But I, I wanted to be home. I wanted to be home having a slice of my mother's pecan pie and listen to her sing Motown Christmas carols that she cooked and baked in the kitchen. This is a complete 180 from just a few weeks prior when I couldn't have left Cleveland soon enough. I questioned whether or not it was counterproductive to have come out to my mother and then join an organization whose policy at the time was don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> I was 18, fresh out of high school, and very naive about what was socially acceptable at the time. My parents were divorced and had not been speak on speaking terms for years. I sat my mom down in the living room, just the two of us. My mouth felt dry and I had a distinct feeling that the words wouldn't come when my lips began to move. I'm gay. She cursed under her breath and just stared at me for a moment. Then came a barrage where I can only imagine were rhetorical questions and statements since I wasn't given enough time to respond. Are you sure? Have you been with a woman? I mean, a real woman. <laughs> This cannot be happening. Have you prayed on it? You're going to get AIDS. Aren't you afraid of AIDS? In retrospect, I would have been equally surprised if she had been accepting. No more than 20 minutes later, we were driving across town to my Aunt Ellen's home. The three of us took the warrant and staircase to Aunt Ellen's bedroom. We held hands at the foot of the bed, but not before she rubbed olive oil on our foreheads. The olive oil was used to symbolize purity and faith. It would be years later that I learned people actually cooked with it. <laughs> because at that point, I had only seen it used in prayer. <laughs> Aunt Ellen held both our hands and started to pray. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. Give him his praise, she commanded. My mother and I repeated in unison, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> like all the times before, Aunt Ellen soon started speaking in tongue, and she broke the circle and laid hands on me. Yes, yes, destruction. You are headed down the path of destruction, my son. Don't let the devil lead you astray. He is a liar, a cheat, and a thief. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants your soul. She shouted with the fiery tone of a preacher. I felt numb. She went on for several more minutes. I don't know how long we were in the bedroom praying, but when it was all over with, I was drained, confused, and more helpless than when we started. Just barely out of high school, I moved out on my own and still spent the next couple of years being assaulted with Bible verses and looks of disappointment. Somehow, just living in the same city felt unbearable. I was the proverbial black sheep, an outcast. I decided to leave. The enlistment process was a blur. I remember tests and plenty of paperwork. At one point, I was downtown lined up with about 30 other guys. We were all in our underwear being subjected to physicals and exams and herded around. We were barefoot and the floor was cold. Later, there were stacks of paperwork presented to me by my recruiter for signature. Most sheets were white but occasionally I was presented with a pink or yellow form with carbon copies. One was a health questionnaire. My eyes immediately focused on a black line created by magic marker in order to conceal a particular question. The exact wording eludes me, but ultimately, it was asking if I was a homosexual. The don't ask, don't tell policy was so new that paperwork hadn't even been changed yet. After basic training in the technical school, I was en route to my first duty station, Allison Air Force Base, Alaska, the place I will live the next three years. During the layover in Anchorage, I boarded a much smaller plane than the one I arrived on. A sign, Fairbanks didn't have quite the draw as Anchorage. I couldn't have been more of an oddity on my flight. The average person on board was about 60, and I was the only person of color. The flight was less than an hour. Just enough time to guzzle down a Dixie cup size of Coke and explain to the gray-haired gentleman sitting beside me that I was reporting to my first duty station. He thanked me for my service. As I got off the plane, the air was musky. It was something like I smelled once before at camp when I was 12. The counselor said that was the smell of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I followed the crowd into the airport directly from the tarmac we disembarked on. I cringed once inside. Stuffed moose, bears, and other wild, wildlife was being passed off as airport decor. <laughs> After checking in at the base, I used the phone in the common area to call my mother. Luckily, it was deserted. I made it here, I said. It is different. <laughs> I can't believe you're in Alaska. It's so far away, she said. How are you feeling? I asked. A couple months before my departure, she was having respiratory issues and was diagnosed with lupus. I'm doing better. God is good, she said. She also went from part-time saint to full-time. She no longer wore pants or makeup. Well, she wore skirts, that's what I'm <laughs> She put her hair in a swooped up church lady bun daily. I just wanted to check in. I need to get settled. Okay, I'm praying for you. We were the cable dogs. We installed and repaired telephone trunk cables, both underground and aerial. Upon my arrival to Allison, the shot was nearly completing the installation of the local area network to all the buildings on base. They were just getting the internet. Our shot maintained a force of eight to 12 people at a time, depending on the comings and goings. Most of the guys were married. There was something about Alaska that made people couple off quickly even the young ones. At times, we worked hard. Foosball tournaments went on daily during the lunch. I was a go-to guy only if a fourth player was needed and no one was available in a two-mile two radius. I hated foosball. <laughs> Dipping chewing tobacco was another pastime of theirs, and I was warned to always check my Coke can because there was the one time someone took a swig from the wrong Coke can. They compared who had the loudest or smelliest farts. I declined. <laughs> they hunted and fished in their spare time. I drank and partied. They knew I was different, but I hope they believe I just wasn't into crazy white people shit <laughs> and not gay. Either way, they never treated me any different. Back then, Fairbanks didn't exactly have gay bars and the internet was barely on the scene. So long before my arrival, I'd done my research and that led me to Alaska Land, a 33-acre theme park. <laughs> the park was designed to look like an authentic gold mining town from the 1920s. I walked by a general store, a life-size riverboat, a carousel, a gazebo, and a modern-day food court. It was after hours, so the park was quite deserted. This could not be the place, I thought. But my, great, my gig travel guide I purchased Months prior, I said, seek out the saloon. <laughs> it was more of a borrowed space than a gay bar. During the day, it was filled with families and tourists visiting the historic park. But at night, you had the likes of me lurking around looking for others like me. The whole situation felt very clandestine, unsettling to me, which gave me the feeling of wrongdoing. Like the Gestapo could bust through the door at any moment. The DJ was set up near a stage framed by a thick red velvet curtain where I pictured a line of can-can dancers performing for grungy prospectors. There was a typical moose head hanging on the wall along with mining paraphernalia. It nearly looked like TGI Fridays. <laughs> a few tables and chairs remained on the floor while others were pushed aside for what I reasoned was to make room for dancing. No one was dancing. <laughs> Incidentally, the people in tennis very much reminded me of prospectors, but nothing like the groom hipster crowd of today. They were just real Alaska men who just happened to be gay, who didn't give a fuck about what was in fashion. <laughs> Thick beers and flannel was the dress code. They scared me. <laughs> Not intimidating necessarily, but in a sort of, you look homeless, please don't touch me sort of way. <laughs> I sat in the corner sipping my beer, wondering how was I going to make it through the next few years. I envisioned a future of celibacy, meditating, and lots of exercise. But on one of my trips to the saloon, I met Damon. He was stationed on Fort Wainwright, just on the edge of town. He was tall, lean, with a mocha complexion. I noticed him earlier talking with a group of girls on the other side of the dance floor. Oh, shit, another brother, he said, and introduced himself. To reasons even unknown to me, I immediately felt awkward and guarded. 
I was in Alaska in the military. I hadn't done this song and dance and meeting someone in quite some time. I didn't know his game either. Often you would meet a guy at the saloon who claimed to be there for the music because apparently the saloon played the best fucking music in town. <laughs> but I figured out his game when he asked if I wanted to dance. I hesitated and looked around. Only a handful of people bounced around on the dance floor and I felt, like, I felt as if people were already watching us. But before I could say no, he pulled me onto the dance floor. Suddenly, I had no rhythm. <laughs> I did an awkward two-step. When I had had enough, I offered to buy a round of drinks. As I handed him his beer, I noticed the wedding ring. Oh, just the marriage of convenience, he smirked. I didn't know whether or not to believe him. It was a phrase thrown around a lot in private inner circles of military personnel. People married for money, to get out of the dorms and assignments. At that moment, I don't think I particularly cared. Over time, the more I got to know Damon, the more I sometimes wish we hadn't met. It wasn't that he was a bad person or hurtful, but he reminded me of myself, the person I was trying to escape. I could have been cursed into marriage and lived a miserable existence. I will later find out the wife of convenience he spoke of was fully aware of his sexuality, but was desperately trying to save the marriage with the help of Jesus and the church. Frankly, his world confused me. One day, sex with me, the next day he confessed in his sins to the pastor at church where he was a deacon. Or a deacon. It saddened me that Damon was desperately trying to do the right thing, but will always fall short in the eyes of his faith. My time in Alaska felt like a prison sentence at times. There were people in my, in my life, but most, with the exception of Damon, felt like acquaintances. None of them really knew me because I didn't allow them to. To survive, I had to live under the radar. It was like three years of solitary confinement. About three months before my separation, I was on the telephone speaking with my mother when she broached the subject. So after three months, you're done? She asked, you can come home? I don't know when I made the decision not to return to Cleveland. Over my enlistment, the more time I spent away, the less connected I felt to my place of birth. I landed a job with Homeland Security in 2002 upon my separation from the Air Force and re relocated to San Diego. Shortly after I moved, my brother called while I was on my way to work. His voice was heavy. I found her, he said. She was home alone and I found her this morning. What are you talking about? Mom, he said. She's gone. I looked around, surrounded by cars, unable to move. The thought of my mother alone with no one there seemed unfair to me. Living in California away from home suddenly felt like a selfish act. I thought about the last conversation I had with my mom. Hey, do you remember that saxophone solo you had in 11th grade, she asked. I don't know why she would bring up something so random and so long ago, but I said that I did. I was so proud of you, she said, and I still am. She would pass away two days later. I wondered if this was her last gift to me, releasing her firstborn from the torment and confusion she knew I battled with and maybe she in indirectly contributed to. I knew through it all that she only wanted the best for me. Mistakes were made, but I know she did her best. Perhaps she needed to be cleansed of her faults and misgivings. Whatever the reasons, I think we both were set free.